Hello, BookTube. Well, you know, it's very nearly a bleak and barren Monday today because Christmas Day fell on a Sunday, which means it's being officially observed today, which means half the places Steve goes on his uh, little two-hour errands are closed <laughs> or feel like they ought to be closed. <laughs> uh, fortunately, my various used book haunts here in Boston are were open for business and do and happy to see me. <laughs> so and as a result, I have a, a bunch of great books I want to show you that I got uh, today uh, for your consideration <laughs> when you go out shopping yourself. Uh, and the first one is an author I've praised on this channel before. This is Jenny Uglow, The Lunar Men. It's a it's a big thick history that I somehow managed not to have. I read it and loved it. Uh, it's a story of a group of <laughs> a group of men and women in the 1760s in the British Midlands, who uh, came together out of sheer geekish enthusiasm, shared enthusiasm, for the for understanding the workings of the natural world. Right on the, on the edge of, of the explosion of science, they were sort of laying the groundwork for it, informally, amongst themselves. There was uh, uh, Josiah Wedgwood, uh, the, the patriarch of the famous... Uh, porcelain clan that became mind-bogglingly wealthy. Uh, there were uh, botanists and scientists. There was Erasmus Darwin, the grandfather of Charles Darwin, who, who uh, presaged a lot of his opinions about evolution. And they all came together, and this book tells a story like nothing. Oh, <laughs> uh, Jenny Hugo brings out the personalities. She's done an enormous amount of research. It's not your usual subject. It's just... And it, you come out of it uh, thrilled with the the adventure of the mind, which is a great it's a great thing. Uh, so I found that for virtually free. Next one also virtually free is this. This is Bob Spitz's biography of the Beatles, and of all the biographies of the Beatles that I have read, it is by far the best written. It's the, uh, the facts are pretty much the same. Uh, the the tedium of of studying a rock band <laughs> is, is pretty much the same, but his writing, oh my God, had I been reviewing books when this came out, I would have praised it from the rooftops and I praise it to you. If you're a fan of the Beatles, uh, next one is a, is a, a little subject of interest of mine. It's, it's rocket man by Craig Nelson. He was a publishing poobah forever and ever. And finally ended up writing his book. And this is a history of the, of the, the missions to land a man on the moon uh, and the whole story of it, not just the minute that everybody knows from video. It's an incredible story. And as he, in, as he emphasizes in this book, I read it when it first came out and loved it. I have a, I have a sweet tooth for lunar expedition books. Uh, I think that age of heroism was, you know, starting to look more and more singular as time goes on. Uh, but he emphasizes in this book that the, the success was by no means assured that, that even at the, at the moment that it was all happening, people weren't sure that the crafts weren't going to fly apart, that the men weren't going to die the instant the, the suits were exposed to hard vacuum. That's just wonderful. And so I was glad to find a copy. And then another one, uh, not, so, not sure I'm glad to find a copy, but it was, it's this. It's this enormous uh, biography of Mao, who is, you know, he's incredibly important in 20th century history. And I read this when it first came out and everybody was praising the daylights out of it. And I, I thought it was really, really good. Uh, but I didn't hesitate to get rid of it once I was done reading it. And the reason I got it again, aside from the fact that it was free and it's in perfect condition, uh, is that it's one of those nonfiction books where as time has gone on, I have started to, I've kept thinking about it. So that's usually a signal to me that I need to reread it. Uh, so I will do that. And now I have a copy. And then the next one is uh, it's a hardcover, something we've seen on this channel before. Uh, it's The End of Faith by Sam Harris. This is his contribution to the uh, the glut from 10 years ago of uh, new atheist tracks. The, the, the God Delusion by Richard Dawkins, the uh, Darwin's Black Box, the, the, you know, on either side of the question of faith, there was... Uh, of course, God is not great by Christopher Hitchens. And this was his, this and Letter to a Christian Nation. Uh, and I read it when it first came out, and I read all of those books as they were all of a sudden topping the charts. And uh, I thought, well, okay, you're not doing any yourself any favors by how obnoxious this reads. <laughs> no, one, no one who's on the fence 
is going to think for a minute about joining a side that has you as a member. <laughs> but uh, uh, the points can't help but be more poignant now. I haven't read this book in quite some time, so I'm, I'm going to reread it now. I found a hardcover, and I don't remember ever owning a hardcover. I, I have the, on the shelf, I have a paperback, and that's, I think, all I've ever owned. So now I have that. <laughs> the next one is a modern-day nonfiction classic. <laughs> and the only reason I didn't have a copy already is because every time I have a copy, I give it away. <laughs> it's this. The Mole People. <laughs> this is a study of the various societies of people who live in the tunnels underneath New York City. Not just the abandoned tunnels near the surface, the way up at the top where the normal subway runs, but far below those tunnels, service tunnels, excavation tunnels, abandoned quarries, going down all the way to the very bottom of the bedrock on which rests Manhattan. And this author delved into that world and found societies of people, of homeless people who, I guess you can't call them homeless then anymore. They, they have rotating staffs of people who keep the fires of it, who, whose job it is to go and get food, whose job it is to cook it. They're, they have different sleeping arrangements. And then down below them, there are lower levels where they tell the author, you know, you don't want to be down here because there's a guy down here dressed as the Grim Reaper who kills people when he finds them. He just stalks these hallways. Nobody knows who he is. And then far, far below even that, Nestled on rock cliffs, washed in the foam of invisible rivers down below in the crevasses. A society of people who live on those cliffs. A mile below the surface of Manhattan. Directly below the surface of Manhattan. So when you're looking at Times Square, this is going on a mile below your feet. And according to... The author never, of course, sees these people. He doesn't get close enough. But according to the people he talks to who have... They've been down there for generations, and they live in the constant roar of the subterranean rivers to the point where they have evolved a chirping language and no longer speak English. Nobody knows what they live on. It might be fish in the still pools of those subterranean rivers. It might be, uh, for all we know, a white fungus that doesn't require photosynthesis, but is still nutritious. Who knows? <laughs> this, this is... <laughs> it will keep you up breathing. It's a classic. I was so happy to find a copy. Uh, the next one, also a classic of a very different kind, uh, equally horrifying, though, is is uh, this. It's The Great Terror by Robert Conquest. This is his, his enormous classic about Stalin's terror uh, that got so much, got him so much criticism in his own day uh, for reasons that we'll look back on now and think, why on earth would anybody object to that? But it makes sense. At the time... There were still residual feelings of Stalin being Uncle Joe, about him being an ally during the war, about him being, you know, not so bad, kind of kind of friendly looking. <laughs> uh, and Conquest blows that all to pieces. His book is all about what a ruthless megalomaniac tyrant this guy was and how fond he was of exterminating his own people. Uh, and the, the original research involved paints a worse and worse picture with every page you turn. Uh, and... He got brickbats for that, but the book reads fantastic. And I also like, I have to admit, I also like how pugnacious he was in defending his own work right from the beginning. He couldn't stand people being little delivered. said facts are facts, <laughs> and I like that. Uh, I might be a, a little biased, because we, we corresponded for a couple of years. He was for, he was briefly a customer of mine. Uh, on a completely unrelated subject, we never, I don't think, ever wrote about uh, Russia. We wrote about science fiction. <laughs> He he uh he said you seem to know your science fiction, <laughs> and so, so we we uh, we corresponded on that. But uh, I didn't have a copy of this book, and for some reason, reprints of it are hard to find. Uh, so I was glad to find this, especially since it's a Pimlico paperback, which I just love. If if I have a choice and there's a, a book in a paperback that I want, and I see a Pimlico, I grab it right away. I just love them. I love the look of them. Uh, the next one. Next one's a classic as well. Haven't read it in forever. I was amazed to find it. It needs a little repair, but I can do that. It's How to Travel with Parents by Eloise Barrington. It's a travel guide from, oh God, this has to be the 1950s. Uh, 
1956. It's a travel guide told from the point of view of a kid about how hard it is to travel with parents, how much work they need. <laughs> and the, the, the conceit is kept up beautifully throughout the whole thing <laughs> about, about how to keep them interested, how to keep them from fussing. <laughs> uh, and I think is probably as true today as it was the day it was written. <laughs> so it's a cl an old classic. I was glad to find it. Uh, it will bring me a lot of joy to reread it. And then the last thing for today is a cl uh, this thing. World War I by General Marshall, who uh, literally wrote the book <laughs> on, on writing military history. He, he, in the War Department back, you know, a million years ago, he set the protocols for how you write history <laughs> uh, and wrote accordingly and you would think therefore that his this is a massive book of his on world war one and you would think that that would make it boring that he's a fantastic writer oh uh, you will see this book his book on world war one one of the one of the best overviews of world war one that's ever been written no matter how old it is I, mean, I don't even know how old this thing is it must be 50 years old um 1964 uh no matter how many one-volume uh, overviews of World War I you have read or seen, you will see this one in used bookstores. It has a healthy life. In fact, it might still be in print, and uh, there's a reason for that. It's really, really good. If you're looking for a one-volume introduction to the to the whole subject of World War I, look no further. This is the one. Uh, and there you go. That was a that was a. Uh, post-holiday Monday book haul <laughs> of all sorts of things that's from the things that I'm looking forward to rereading and then maybe getting rid of again to things that I'm looking forward to uh, putting in my collection because I've, I've been without them for one reason or another. Uh, and tomorrow I'm hoping that Boston and the rest of the world gets back to normal for a couple of days before we go through this all over again with New Year's. <laughs> in the meantime, I'll see you soon, BookTube. Thank you.